think what I want it to be is as real and true to form as it can be, right? Because I want it to, to stay real for the good and the bad, right? I mean, because it was, it was such a foundational moment of my life, you know what I mean? That you don't want it to get twisted in any way. You want to keep it real. Uh, but I also want to walk away remembering that there's, there's good in it. There is still, you know, there's still good moments in all that chaos. I was the Regimental Combat Team 7 with 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division Combat Camera Chief during the Fallujah campaign of OIF 2 TAC 2. Uh, I've served with that from August of 2004 until March of 2005. Being a combat photographer, you're always out documenting what others are doing, right? So everybody wants pictures. So it was always like, hey, come, you know, besides the normal grip and grin ceremonies, but it's, hey, we're gonna go do this artillery reload. Can you come out and take some pictures? Yeah, come out and you watch you guys shoot artillery. Hey, let's come up, take pictures of us jumping out of airplanes or helicopters. Uh, let's go on a submarine and swim out of torpedo tubes. You know what I mean? So, uh, I mean, I got to do all these things and see the Marine Corps, you know what I mean? From so many facets and so many aspects without actually having to be in those MOSs, you know what I mean? Just. It was awesome, it was just, it was the best. Obviously as we were building up for the push to Fallujah, the planning was intense, the meetings were intense, priorities of, of imagery acquisition, right? Like I had imagery priorities that were coming down. So some of the ones I really, really remember, violations of you know international law, like, hey, th those are top part. Like if you, if you get it, you gotta get that imagery out like ASAP, you know, like we need to see those things. Insurgents in mosques, if there were chemical or biological weapons being found or things along those lines, um, you know, intelligence types, things would be of importance to intelligence. Every unit going in, you know what I mean, into the city was going to have combat camera support in one way, shape, or form or another. And I uh, put my plan together, I go in and I actually was briefing the regimental commander, Colonel Tucker, you know, and he was like, you know, F no. He's like, you're not sending a female Marine with a line company into, you know, into major combat. He's like, it's not happening. I'm like, sir, she's, she's the only Marine I got. So the only options to have me go and leave her behind, you know, and he was like, okay, you're going. And that was it. And that is how the regimental combat camera chief wound up with Bravo Company 1-8, you know, for the push into Fallujah. It, it, the intensity of that fight on a day-to-day -day basis is, is just so heightened that it's, it's hard, to, I mean, at least for me, it was hard to find that level of combat fatigue. The further the fight goes on, the more you realize how how any moment is your moment. We'd moved up to this main intersection and we had, you know, part of the company in one building to the left-hand side and they had, you know, the machine guns on Overwatch on the top of this building and we had machine guns on the over, Overwatch at the top of the building to the other side. And across the street, as I look at it at about 11 o'clock is, you know, the, the, is our objective building. And across the street to, you know, 12, one o'clock, two o'clock is it like an apartment complex that's just chock full of insurgents. I mean, it is, it's a hornet's nest of insurgents. I don't know how many over there, a lot. We had insurgents that drove up behind us in an SUV, uh, you know, they, they came right, I mean, literally drove up the same alleyway we had been walking up and they pulled right up behind us and, um, you know, our machine gunners up on the top of the building, they, they, they mowed them down, you know what I mean? These guys are pounding out of the cars, they're mowing them down. And uh, some of, two of them got in a the courtyard and the Marines went over there and, you know, threw the frags and fragged them out. And, uh, but I mean, like they're right there. Like they just came up behind you and you're like, like again, you're just like, this place is insane. You know what I mean? Like a, an SUV, you know, a Jeep Cherokee full of insurgents just dr literally drove up our, you know, our six and uh, was right there behind us. And again, uh, thankfully, you know, that, that turned out okay. That was the second Marine to cross the street. So it was me and another Marine and they're like, go. And we're running and the, and the Marine I'm with, he gets shot in the back and he gets hit and he's like, I'm hit. And we get to the other side and I drag him behind this little wall and uh, pull off his pack. And thankfully his sappy plate had stopped the round. So he, you know, he was okay, you know, all things considered. So I'm like, hey, get up. And of course that's where we, you know, um, Sergeant Lonnie Wells got shot and Gunny Shane got shot. Um, Lance Corporal Chris ultimately trying to retrieve them got shot. I mean, it might have only been four or five of us on the other side at that point. I had forgotten about my camera and I picked up my rifle and I got on the corner of the building and I started putting suppressive fires down 
on the apartment complex. Some purists will say, never put your camera down. And I don't, I don't know, for me, I couldn't do that. You know, I was, I was, I went back to the mantra of, you know, every Marine's rifleman. And, and I knew that my team in that moment needed my rifle more than they needed my camera. You know, of course, I got some pictures of, of the, you know, the evac process of getting Chris and Sergeant Wells and, and Gunny Shane and stuff on the evac. And those are, those are pretty traumatic to look at, you know, the, some of those guys, especially, you know, of course, Sergeant Lonnie Wells and, you know, bled out before we could get him out of there, you know, and um, that kind of, that hurts. After we'd gotten the casualties out, there was all the equipment in the road and uh, Staff, Staff Sergeant Brown, who was the platoon sergeant for first platoon was like, hey, I'm gonna go out there and get, you know, get this stuff. And I was like, dude, no way. Like we can't lose another platoon sergeant on day one. You know what I mean? We've already lost one staff and CO, you know what I mean? On the first, first time. And I was like, I'm gonna, let me go. And he was like, what? And I'm like, the company, the platoon can't afford to lose you. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, unfortunately, you can afford to lose me. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's, it's hard to say, but I'm a picture taker. You know what I mean? Like, and so, uh, yeah, I ran back out in that, in that same kill zone and ran out there like a chicken, you know, zigging and zagging and grabbed the weapons and stuff off the road and uh, rounds snapping off the street. Yeah, grabbed all those weapons out of the street so the insurgents couldn't, you know, use them against us, especially the, the optics, you know what I mean? And uh, sometimes the camera's just not the most important thing in a fight. On, on that night, um, we got ambushed in the alleyway. Um, I was on patrol, obviously, with, with the platoon. The lead, the elite element, the first fire team and the folks had gone around, you know, gone around the corner and they were up ahead of us. All of a sudden, just all hell breaks loose and you hear, you know, you hear the freaking, the automatic weapons fire and everything like that. And you start hearing the freaking cries. So I ran around the corner. I could hear Anderson at, at the, towards the far end of the, uh, Hear Anderson at the far end of the alleyway crying, crying out for help. And Russell was wedged up between the wall of the alleyway and the staircase, kind of down in the dark. And so I climbed the stairs. I, I, I couldn't see anything. It was pitch, you know, it was pitch black. And so I, you know, you talk about stupid, dumb mistakes sometimes. But I went white light just for the briefest. So I threw, turned my white flashlight so I could see what was going on. And his. His leg was there and it was barely hanging on. He, he said, Russell, you gotta put your tourniquet on. Like, put a tourniquet on. And uh, the insurgents were still at the end of the alleyway. Um, the white light skylined me, so they started firing back down the alleyway. And they barely missed me. The, the rounds bounced off the wall next to my head. And I jumped down. I wound up breaking my camera that had my night vision. And honestly, this is where time flies. And I don't know how long we were there, you know, but I, I could hear them. I heard, you know, I certainly saw Aubrey grabbing, you know, um, Anderson and stripping him off his gear and picking him up and trying to, you know, and, and taking him out. And I never really heard him come back for Russell, you know what I mean? But he came back and grabbed Russell um, and pulled him out of the alleyway. And I turned around and started then grabbing all their gear out of the alleyway. So I was grabbing Anderson's gear and I was grabbing what was left, you know, Russell's stuff. And I got back and they already had Anderson on the medevac and they were putting Russell in there and we were loading him up and we, we you know, we got him out and uh, off they went. Nothing I've ever done or ever will do probably will compare to that moment in my Marine Corps career, doing what Marines are trained to do, going into combat, the, the most intense, the bloodiest, the you know, house to house, hand to hand type fighting that we, you read about you know, in the annuals of our, of our course history and being part of that. At the same time, it's one of the worst times in my career, right? I mean, you, because you, you've lost so many on the battlefield, you know? Um, Miller and Brown and Wells and Ski and you go on and on and I just, you, it's so hard. I mean, you think about November and, and November is such a tough month in my life to deal with, you know what I mean? I'm sure for a lot of those guys, you know, you, you want to celebrate the Marine Corps birthday, but your brothers are dying on the Marine Corps birthday, right? And, and you want to celebrate Thanksgiving, but your brothers are dying on Thanksgiving. And it's really hard to, um, 
it's really hard to find the same joy in some of those things as Marines, you know what I mean? And Thanksgiving was always my favorite holiday, you know what I mean? And so it's really hard to find some of that joy in those same moments because you're always reflective. You walk away in general life dealing with the scars, you know, the life scars, being hyper vigilant, you know, and behavioral changes and always having to sit with your backs freaking, you know what I mean, to the wall and being able to know what's going on around you. And it's really what it does to you is like, you know, walking into my therapist's office and sitting down and, you know, and looking around like, what would I do if somebody came in here? I would use that fire extinguisher. Or I'd pick up that clock or I would like, how could I hurt somebody if I had to survive? And, and so it changes you like that. I was never like that. You know what I mean? Beforehand, you never thought about those things. I, don't, I never turned to alcohol or drugs or anything like that. You know, that's just not my style. But for me, it's been more compartmentalization and, you know, just kind of keeping in isolation, you know, which is, again, those two things aren't healthy either. And you can know they're not healthy. And there's a thing between, you know, the leader of me is like would never tell my Marines to do those things, right? I'd be like, go out and get help or talk it out. And when it's yourself, it's a, you know, it's, it's hard to tell yourself, you know what I mean? Or get yourself to do the, the right thing or the different thing. Um, and it's, it's taken a while. And like I said, it's, it's happening slow but sure. They talk about people have photographic memories. I don't have a photographic memory, but I have memories and photographs. And so for me, I see that entire, you know, 20 something days in still frames and snippets, you know, the frames that I have and I captured and those memories and how things transpired to me are single frame images. Like this is the moment or this is a moment and it's that unit, it's the Marine Corps moment, it's one eighth moment, you know? And so being able to tell and have those imageries to tell their story, you know, all these years later, it's, I feel like that's pretty special and it helps me deal with it, you know, deal with that larger, you know, that process. Remember that it did, you didn't get here and these don't, things don't come for free. Men and women die for us to have the quality of life that we have in this great nation. And we can't lose sight of that. Um, and we can't forget them. God bless the Marines. Like Marines are fucking the baddest force in the world. You know what I mean? Like they are awesome. There's nothing more glorious than watching these bastards in combat. You know what I mean? Um, and fighting for your brothers and your sisters to your left and your right, like it is, it is something. There's nothing like it.